West Wins, how y'all doing today? Great, great, great. Uh, before I get started, I do want to apologize for my voice. It's going to get better as I talk, but uh, yes, it is. Amen? Pray for me. I've been losing my voice for the last two weeks, and uh, I said, I got to talk today. And so, But I'm here, and I'm glad to be here with West Winds. Amen. Y'all glad to be here today? Well, cool, cool, cool. Uh, those who don't know me, my name is Corey Pryor. She said I, uh, I was here a couple of months ago, and in between that time, I had a chance to meet your new pastor, Pastor Corey, right? How many of y'all love Pastor Corey? Come on, give him, make some noise for him. He's going to see this. Well, I met with Pastor Corey, and, and, and I, I, I love his heart. I love the vision that he has for this ministry. I love the vision that he has for the people of, of West Winds and what you're going to do in our community, not just here on the corner of Robson and McCain, but throughout the Jackson County area. And I really appreciate that. First of all, I want to give an honor to God who has been head of my life to my wonderful wife who is with me, Julie. Amen. I have a few members that came along with us. they over here. They're up on top of the hill. Hey, man, we are glad you're here today. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation. We're going to have a conversation today. Uh, I'm going to do most of the talking, though. Um, but, but we're going to have a conversation because I want you guys to, to, to feel, fit into what Pastor Corey has a desire to do. Like I said, I met him. We sat down and we talked for an hour and a half. And, and just, just kicked it and got to know each other. And, and he began to tell me that last month, July, he was sharing about who God is. Am I right? Who God is. And he said this month, July, he wants to show how God wants to use you or work through your ordinary lives. Okay? How he has called you. How he wants to uh, uh, work wondrous things through the things that you do naturally. And so I said, well, I'm going to try to fill that, uh, uh, that, that gap because I did not know early on that he was not going to be here. Uh, but that's okay. That's okay. Because I said, hey, Pastor Corey, are you sure you want me to come back? He said, absolutely. I'm not going to be there. I said, okay. <clears throat> so you're not setting him up, are you? But he said, I'm not going to be there. And, and then he said, I got to know him. And then he said, uh, I said, but I'm Corey with an E. I have an E in my name. E is extra large. E... <laughs> E is excited. E is enthusiastic. He said, well, I'm, just, I'm Corey. I said, cool. Well, what's your wife's name? He said, Corey. I said, no, seriously, what's your wife's name? He said, Corey. I said, okay, well, all right then. Um, my wife's name is Julie, but your wife's Corey. Tell me, did you name any of your kids Corey? He said, uh, I, I lost that battle, so he doesn't have any Corys. Either way, I'm excited to be here. So we're going we're gonna to talk today about how God wants to use you. Uh, and I, I do believe that God has a great purpose for your life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start out by reading Romans 8, verses 28 through 31. I'm reading out of the, the English Standard Version. And it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestinated, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Thank God for the reading of his word. Before I pray, I, I want to tell this quick story because we're going to talk about being called uh, and being able to hear the voice of God. If I put a title on this, it would be the, the call of God. Subtitle would be the answer. The call of God. Subtitle would be the answer. Early part of the 20th century, there was a job posting for uh, at a telegraph office for those to come in and and had proficient knowledge to the Morse code. Any of y'all know what the Morse code is? Morse code. Do, 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 do. That Morse code. Uh, I know the youth that have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Okay. It was texting way back in the day. But you had to be proficient in the Morse code. And uh, either way, the office was filled with people. They were all around applying for this job. And then this young man came into the office, 
And when he got there, he walked up, filled out the application, and sat down. And after a few minutes, he got up and just walked into the supervisor's office. Everybody looked profound, like, what in the world is going on? Well, after just another few minutes, the supervisor came out with the young man in arm and said, hey, um, the job has been filled. This young man now has the job. And everybody in the office was perturbed because we've been here. We've been here for hours, and he just walked in, and you gave him the job right now? That's not fair. And he, the supervisor said, it was fair. He said, all while you guys have been sitting here, I've been sending out a Morse code to say, if you understand this message, come to my office. The job is yours. <laughs> so the question is today is how tuned in are you to God's call? Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for this West Winds family. I thank you for the greatness that we see on these grounds and we see in the pastor that's here on these here today, Lord God. I'm asking that you just have your way. Open our hearts up. Open our minds up to be receptive to your spirit. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. All right, cool, cool. So um, last time I was here, um, I, I spoke about the gains we acquire in the process of the journey, okay? And, and I used Moses as a his life as a backdrop to emphasize the point that I was trying to make then. Well, I'm going to use my good old buddy Moses again uh, just because I want to paint a picture that I want to display to you today. First thing you need to know about Moses is that Moses was born an Israelite to the tribe of Levi, but yet he was brought up in the manner of Egyptians' skills and education. Well, let's skip through his life. At the age of 40, Moses... Um, went down to see his Hebrew brethren, and when he got down there, he was aggravated and frustrated by the burden and the harsh treatment that they received at the hands of the Egyptian slave masters. Well, therefore, Moses got hot mad, and he went rogue. And Moses ended up killing one of the Egyptians in favor of the Israelite. Well, after he did that, after he did what he thought was right, his own people, his own people rejected him. They rejected him and rebelled against him. So now he's feeling that he's unwanted by the Israelites and being unaccepted by the Egyptians, he fled to the land of Midian. And there he became a herdsman. And when he was there, uh, he married the poor, had some kids, and his life went on. He got comfortable being who he was. He got comfortable just being a normal guy, just doing normal everything things, and he was just happy as he could possibly be. Well, he settled in, lived an ordinary life, and had moved on from his past. And for a good portion of his life, we find that he was tending to flock. He was tending to the flock. Now, metaphorically, that means that he was tending to his own business. It means that he was tending to his own life. He was taking care of his own family. He was tending to the cares of the world, concerned about job. You know how we are. We're concerned about job. We're concerned about business. We're concerned about education. We're concerned about uh, health. We're concerned about wealth. He spent his valuable days handling day-to-day -day affairs, okay? Now, literally tending to flock, it was a dangerous thing to do. Moses had never done any kind of work before, but, but he, he, what, conformed to the ways of survival. Stick with me. It's going to come together and be real good in a minute. And, and, and he was good. Moses was good at what he did. And his life was good. And then one day, he saw something. He saw something. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. That's the burning bush. Okay. He, and, and it compelled him. It drew him. It called him. Listen, it called him what he wasn't even thinking about God. It called him what he wasn't even thinking about doing anything for God. But how many of you know that God's call would disrupt your life? God's call will disrupt your life. You got everything all planned out. You got it all figured out. You got your life charted. On, on Monday, I'm going to do this. Tuesday this, Wednesday this, Thursday, Friday, weekends are filled. By the time I'm 30, I'm going to have done such and such. By the time I'm 40, I'm going to have this much in my bank account. I'm going to be about my way to retirement. You got it all figured out. And then God disturbs everything that you thought about. I had plans, God. 
I heard a joke said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. But he comes to you, and he disturbs you at the wrong time. You know, you have your life planned. You had your mindset that I'm going to do this thing. I got this event planned, and I, gotta, I can't wait to go there and, 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 and do my thing. And God called you before the event happened. But you said, I'm going to go anyway. And you went and you did your thing, but it didn't have the same spark. It didn't have the same flair. Why not? What changed? I'll tell you what changed. It's the same you. It's the same situation. What changed is that he called you. And your spirit knew his voice. The Bible says this, y'all. It says in, in, in John chapter 10, verse 4, it says, After he has brought out all his sheep, he walks ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. And a stranger will they not follow. Why are they not going to follow him? Because, because they know the spirit knew his voice. We're all church goers here. Let's not get beyond who we are. We are spirits that lives in the body. Your spirit knew his voice because he knew you before, and the Bible says, and those he called. Who did he call? Those that he foreknew, okay? And those he foreknew, he did predestinate. And those he did predestinate, those he called. Let me work that for a minute because I, I really do believe that you get this down in your spirit, that little by little, the more spiritually minded we become, the more you become aware of who you really are. And the more you are aware of who you really are, the less you are willing to be who you are not. Okay? And, and, and the closer I get to God, the more I begin to shut off who I was so I can truly be who I'm supposed to be. Here's the conversation now. Now you got to talk to me. Simply say this. He called me. He called me. We're only going to do that a couple more times. He called me. When I was younger, I used to get really confused about this text when it said predestinated, the way the preachers used to preach it. Because the way I, it was preached, it led me to believe that God predestines you, that he makes you live right. Okay? So, so if that was right, that God's going to make you do what's right, that also means that I could go about living like the devil all week long, and when my time came to live righteous, God would just call me, and I'd be like, hello? Oh, oh, it's time? Oh, okay, let me finish what I'm doing, and I'll get right to living right. And then I would straighten up and fly right because God made me do it. But my father said, Corey, you're confusing predestined with predetermined. And, and confusing is confusing, and, and, and we're confusing God's foreknowledge of a situation in life with uh, a forcing of a situation in life is like saying that the weatherman who forecast a blizzard made it snow. Do you understand what I just said? Just because the weatherman forecasted the blizzard, did he make it snow? No, 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 no. He doesn't make it snow just because he, had, he knew it was going to snow. No, man and his finite knowledge compared to God's infinite omniscience, looked at the signs of the atmosphere and said, hey, you better get ready for a blizzard. I can use a blizzard right about now. <laughs> you know, he said, get, he, he said in, in, in wintertime, he said, get dressed, get warm, stock up your food, uh, get your first aid supplies ready. He said, pet supplies, batteries, flashlights, candles, heating and fuel, and any other item that you may need just in case you're stranded for a few days. And then the blizzard happens, right? just as he forecasted. Now, did he make it snow? No. No, he did not. But he foreknew that it would. Now, take that knowledge that he had and multiply it to the highest product until you reach omniscience, and God foreknew you. God knows all about you. And on the basis of that foreknowledge, he predestined you. Pre meaning before, destined meaning ending. So before ending you, God sets you on a course to help you discover who you are and who you are not. How many of you have tried some things you figured out, oh, that's not me. That don't really fit me. I need to go another course. He set things in motion to accommodate what he foreknew about you. He predestined an environment that would cause you to be so uncomfortable with where you were that you would not rest beneath your destiny. He, he disrupted your circumstances. He moved your life around. He ordered your steps. 
He prescribed a level of burn and intensity of uneasiness in your life so that when you overcame this trial, you wouldn't let anybody tell you what your God couldn't do. And for some of you, he allowed so much to be put on you that you thought that you couldn't bear it. But you found out that you could bear it. So when the load got so heavy, instead of collapsing, you just adjusted the way that you carried the weight around. And, and he did this because he foreknew you. And because he foreknew you, he predestined you. And because he predestined you, he called you. Talk to me one time. Say, he called me. He called me because I'm one of those. So if I believe that I'm one of those, I, I, I believe that he called me. No matter what is happening in my life right now, it's all good. Because whatever it is, whatever's going on around me, whatever's happening in my family, it doesn't define me. How do I know that? Because God doesn't call anybody that he doesn't have a plan for. God doesn't call anybody that he does not want. God doesn't call anybody that he does not have a purpose for. So, so don't get distracted by all the noise that's happening in your life, that's happening in your children's lives, that's happening in your grandchildren's lives. Don't get distracted by that and, and the noise that seems to be amplified in the condition of your current situation because you must be able to hear God's call in your life when nobody else can hear it. You must learn to tune out the haters. Haters are those people who don't like you. They just talk bad about you just because they can. You, you're doing real good. Instead of being celebrating you, they go and talk bad about you. They're, do anybody know any of those kind of people? Hopefully you're not married to them. But they're haters. They just hate on your goodness. So either way, you got to learn to get them out of your hearing, get rid of all the doubters and all the naysayers, and learn to tune into God. The story said that two men were walking in a busy city, and one of the men remarks, hey, hey, listen to that lovely sound of a cricket. And his friend said, I don't hear a cricket. How in the world can you say you hear a cricket in all the city noise? He says, I'm a zoologist, and I've been trained to listen for different creatures. He said, I... That doesn't make any sense. How can you hear it over all this noise? He said, rather than trying to explain it to you, let me give you an example. He reached in his pocket, pulled out some change, threw it up in the air in this busy city, and let the change land on the ground. Ching, ling, ling, ling. He said, about 12 people turned around <laughs> trying to find out where that money sound was coming from. He said, we hear what we listen for. We're going to go deep, Tay. We, we hear what we listen for. Jesus said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. My mind goes to a young Samuel. When he got the call of God on his life, he was about 12 years old, 11 or 12, somewhere in there. It's over in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And at, the, at that age, Samuel knew the scriptures. He knew how to serve at the temple. He knew the routines and the practices of the temple. But he didn't know God. Hmm. Huh. How can you go to church day after day, week after week, and not know God? I say that facetiously because it happens all the time. It's good to go to West Winds. It's good to go to Oasis of Love. As long as I don't have to do nothing. They got good music. Both churches got great music. Both pastors are great, got wonderful names like Corey. But you can go there and not know God. Samuel didn't know God. Well, one night he went to lay down in his bed, and he heard a voice of God. But he didn't recognize it as the voice of God. He thought it was the priest Eli. That's what we do today. We, we, we confuse God's voice. You might think it's your spouse. You might think it's your children. You might think it's your neighbors. Anybody but God. That's exactly what young Samuel did. He thought that the voice must belong to, say, uh, to Eli. And he said, Eli, did you call me? Three different times. This shows us that sometimes we just don't hear God's voice as God's voice. But oftentimes God uses others to confirm what he's already been telling you the whole along. You see, it was God calling Samuel, but he wasn't hearing it right. Therefore, he didn't respond right. It took that old priest to show him how to respond. He told Samuel, the next time you hear the call, say, speak, Lord, thy servant hear. 
Now, now, if you haven't been paying attention to anything else I said today, listen to this right here. That word here, your servant here, in the, in the, in the Hebrew is here, it is shema. It means listening with intention to obey. You see, to truly answer God's call is more than just hearing what he said. You have to hear with a humble heart and be willing to do. We often pray and tell God what we want and when we want it. And when we don't get it like we want it, we get upset as though God didn't hear us. You must not have heard me, God. And depending on what denomination you're on, they get louder and louder praying to God. Because if it ain't happening, you got to get real loud with God and shout at God because God can't hear you. At least that's why we pretend that it is. When the truth is, it's not his hearing. We had just may have missed what he said. There's a story about a man and his wife. I got stories. A man and his wife. And uh, the husband feared that his wife was losing her hearing because she never responded to anything that he said. So he called the doctor and told his doctor he's concerned about his wife not hearing him when he called her. He said, is there any way you can examine her? I don't want to make her angry. And the doctor says, let's do a, 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 this is a quick examination, you do this. He said, next time you're about 40 feet away from her, call her with your speaking voice. And if she doesn't answer, move closer. And keep on moving closer till she finally hears you. And that let me know about how bad her hearing is. So sure enough, he was sitting down at home, and that night she was in the kitchen making dinner, and he looked up and said, man, I'm about 40 feet away from her. I got this. He says, dear, what are we having for dinner tonight? No response. He moved 10 feet closer to, to 30 feet. He said, dear... What are we having for dinner tonight? No response. He moved closer. Now he's at 20 feet. He said, dear, what are we having to, for dinner tonight? She still didn't respond. He got 10 feet from her. He said, dear, what are we having for dinner tonight? Still no response. He's frustrated. He didn't know her hearing was that bad. He got it right up on her, and he said, Dear, what are we having for dinner tonight? She said, for the fifth time, James, we're having chicken. <laughs> Did he go over something, y'all, mister? What I'm trying to tell you is that the hearing problem is not with God. The hearing problem is with us. Once again, tell somebody this. He called me. Over in the book of Jeremiah, the Bible says, God said this, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, I ordained thee, I sanctified thee. Ordained means he set you up with a purpose. Sanctified means he, he set you apart. See, I'm trying to tell you that God meant for you not to fit in. You've been trying to fit in with all your buddies, all your friends, and sometimes you just don't fit in. God meant for you uh, to be a misfit. It's okay. God meant for you to, to stand out. God meant for you to search for love that you couldn't find and peace that you couldn't touch and joy that you couldn't hold on to. I'm trying to tell you that God was setting you up the whole time. And that's the confusing part about God's call. When you're not in tune or in one accord with his spirit, you tend to be led by your fleshly desires. And you try to fill a void that only God can fill. So you try this. And that doesn't work. You try that, and that doesn't work. You try another, and that doesn't work. And the reason why is because that's why the Bible tells us to say that you need to walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, when we talk about the flesh, when we talk about spiritual, when we talk about the flesh, the flesh hints at man's mortality and susceptibility to being tempted into doing morally questionable things. So when you hear teaching like this, and I'm just here to help Pastor Corey, I want to get this month of August going strong, is that all I'm trying to do is help you jumpstart your spirit to make you fully aware that after you try to satisfy the flesh and you still feel that you need something, 
that there's another level of you that you're ignoring, and that's your spirit. Hmm. God is not calling your flesh. Mm -mm. He's calling your spirit. Your flesh will never be able to fully answer the call of God. That's why the Bible says we ought to crucify the flesh daily. Because no matter what we're going on and, and in and around our flesh, the flesh tries to answer the call instinctively, and that is in the flesh. You made me mad, so I'm going to make you mad. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. You did wrong by me, so I'm going to do wrong by you. Your flesh wants to act instinctively. How many of you got smacked in the face and the first thing you want to do is go hug somebody? That's usually not the instinct. So the instinct is not to go hug. Maybe it's to go wrestle, but not to go hug. So I'm trying to say this simply, people. That's why the scripture says this. That it says this. It says, forget those things which are behind. That's the fleshly stuff. And reach for those things which are before. That's the spiritual things. And I press toward the mark of the high prize of the calling in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 13, 3, 13 and 14. Back in 1985, Steven Spielberg directed an Academy Award nominated movie, 11 time nominated, The Color Purple. And in that movie, there's a character named Suge. Suge was a showgirl and a mistress. Anyway, skip the story. In that movie, she's, she's in a bar. And one day, she started recalling her past life through all of her ventures, through all her different cities, and, and through all her various lovers, through, through hanging out late night in different kinds of clubs. Despite her unstable ways and her shifting roles, while standing in the midst of this bar, she came to a great realization. And that realization was this, is that although her father, who was a pastor, didn't accept her, although his church that she used to belong to, they didn't accept her because of her lifestyle, she said, I realized this, that God himself had not given up on her. So, so what I'm trying to get to at the end of that movie, if you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, go watch it. You can get it on a VHS tape somewhere. And, and, and <laughs> But at the end of the movie, she's standing in the middle of this bar, and from the depths of her soul, she began to sing the song. God is trying to tell you something. Children of God's are literally closed. I want to ask you a question. Is God trying to tell you something? Maybe God is trying to tell you something through this message. Maybe God is trying to tell you something through the test of the trials that you deal with. Maybe God is trying to tell you something in the, in the hardships that you have. Maybe God is trying to tell you something as you struggle from day to day. Maybe God is trying to tell you something in the, in the continuous blessings that he allowed to be poured into your life. Either way, have you stopped long enough to say, speak, Lord, for I'm listening? Have you said, Lord, I'm sorry? Have you said, Lord, you have my undivided attention? Are you willing to do what God has called you to do? I found this out. I found this out. When I grew up, I realized that God made me. And there's nobody else like me. People may imitate me. And people may imitate you. But look at your own hand and say, you know what? When God made me, he did something there. Brother, when, when God made you, he looked at you and said, ooh, I will never do that again. But he didn't. He made us. And he said, I didn't make any mistakes when I made you. I made you just the way that I want you to be. And I want to share this with you. And I need you to share this with me. Say this one more time. This is the last time I'm going to ask you to say anything. Say, he called me. And because he called you, the word says, those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Now catch this. Justified and glorified is a legal phrase in the Bible, which we stand on before the accuser, and God declares us righteous, which means that we are not guilty. It means that when we answer the call, God solidifies the final removal of sin from our lives of the believers. So my question for you today is simply this. Are you willing to answer the call of God in your life today? Yeah. And when you do that, when you answer that call of God, 
you can walk around with all the surety that if God be for me, because I'm doing what he told me to do, if God be for me, who <laughs> can be against me? West Winds, I love you from the bottom of my heart. I really do. I thank y'all for having me. We're family now. Y'all invited me back twice, so we're family now. If I get invited again, I might be a squatter. But thank y'all for receiving the word of God. Just remember that God calls you in your everyday life. And that is to be the one that he's called to do the things that he wants you to do. God bless you.